My name is Seth, is um, the team lead of the application security team in Unibank of Nigeria. So currently we have um, Bobby Lin. Bobby will be taking us on the section on AMS in CICD security practice through the trial approach. So this session will last for about an hour. We have um, five to 10 minutes towards the end of the section, which will respond to questions. So I will appreciate if you can drop the questions in the Q&A session. At the end of the session, I'll call it or um, we give to Bobby to you, please. Thank you. Thanks, Elvis. Um... So, hi everyone, thanks for joining the session today. Um, so the topic will be on how we can enhance the CICD security practices uh, with three R's. So it stands for three different principles that you can take. So um, the quick introduction, uh, I'm working in crypto.com and my main focus is on application security and DevSecOps. Uh, the outline of this talk is um, at the first part, we will just go through some of the current practices of um, handling CICD secrets and some of the real world cases that we have seen relating to CICD secrets. And the next part of the talk will be more towards the three R's, which is the steps we can take to improve the CICD secrets management. Um, so it stands for three different, in, there will be three different parts that I will go through. And finally, um, there will be a takeaway. So let's get started. Um, so the current practices of CICD secret management here, uh, just a, like an overview of how, in case you are not familiar with the CICD uh, workflow secrets. Uh, usually in a CICD process, there will be kind of like many components interacting with your CI interface. It could be an external CICD provider, or it could be a CICD provider provided by your VCS. And then secrets are stored uh, in different places, maybe in your testing tool, in some SaaS platform you are using, or maybe you are using a secret vault or with the VCS CICD providers. Uh, so whatever it is, right, that there, there are some factors that will affect the secrets um, level of security level of the secrets. So um, the first one is the duration itself, like how long can the secret be used and then when can the secrets be used and who can use it. Usually this involves uh, authentication and authorization and then the location as well. Like where can you use the secrets? For example, you might perform some network restriction on where the secret can be used. And finally is the scope itself. What can the secret do? Uh, this three, uh, this five factors here will um will affect the the risk level of your secrets. And then um uh, just to take an example here, so for example, like uh, a usual JSON web token, uh, usually has a expiry date, and then it has the capabilities of performing some network restrictions. And you can scope the JWT as well. But anyone that possesses JWT, they can actually use the secret. So there's no really like, uh, you can't really authenticate who is actually using this JWT and when you can use it. Uh, the problem comes with um, CICD secrets. There are different kinds of um, inconsistent implementations of these security controls. So maybe vendor A has uh, duration and restrict who can use the secret, but they don't have any scope or some of them have scope and network restriction, but they don't have 
their secrets are actually long lived secrets. So let's go through some of the real world cases that we have seen related to CICD secrets. So the first one, uh, I think it is a huge one. Is um, it happens around this year, earlier this year. So what happened is um, that there was an incident with the CI. So somehow the hacker managed to um, steal the encryption keys and managed to this encryption key can actually decrypt all the customer secrets itself. Because of this incident, um, many customers of Secrecy I has to rotate the secrets urgently. Yeah. And another case will be related to Travis CI. So we have seen cases like um, secrets are being laid in the CI logs itself. And then just with a, a to they have seeds, uh, misconfigurations whereby um, Anyone can just send an API request to search through all the logs of the CI and to see whether there are any secrets being leaked in the logs. Yeah. So another case would be um, sometimes it might not be related to another threat at it's more towards the platform itself. So in this case, um, and if you're familiar with GitHub Actions, so this is called like a workflow, or if you are using other CI tool, this is like your pipeline code. So what happened is um, there's something uh, related to this usage of this uh, input here that you can actually inject uh, malicious uh, payload inside to steal the secrets. Um, so you can see here uh, in this part here, uh, I'm trying to get the comment body of an issue in the GitHub. And then I try to inject a secret. Uh, to, I'm trying to inject a payload to uh, exfiltrate the secrets out of the repo itself. So you can see here, uh, this payload is passing and then uh, it's managed to execute this payload because of some uh, if you use this directly in a run itself, right, in GitHub Actions, you can actually inject, it's actually a command injection issue here. And then um, you can manage to see that the secrets are being exfiltrated out. Yeah, so because of uh, this many issues that is relating to the CICD secrets, so I see there's a change in assumptions that we have about storing the secrets with the CICD providers. Uh, instead of thinking that we can just save all kinds of secrets in the CICD platform, uh, and we think it's safe to do that, uh, now we need to change some of our assumptions here. Like how do we better, better secure this? Uh, so I have three different uh, approaches uh, that we can take here. First, we need to reduce the number of secrets that we store with the CI/CD providers. And then second is to reduce the usage of any long-lived secrets with the CI/CD providers. And lastly, we need to find a way to detect and really prevent these secrets from being leaked in the CI/CD workflows. Okay, let me start with the first principle. This is to reduce the storage of secrets within the CI CD providers. Uh, in the modern CI CD workflows, we know that uh, they are quite capable. They are not just running builds and deploying uh, software. Uh, they actually has many capabilities. You can do a lot of automations here. Maybe you want to run a batch job to fetch certain data and generate a report, or you want to interact with another SaaS platform to uh, perform an action. Yeah, so it goes beyond just building, testing, and deploying stuff. So what it means is that you can actually find all kinds of secrets stored in the CICD providers by your uh, team itself. So 
you could be finding SSH keys, some API tokens from relating to a SaaS platform, etc. Because of this, uh, it's actually like an interesting uh, target here. It's an attractive target for any threat actors to actually find out what kind of secrets you store inside your CIC providers. Uh, so the problem with storing too many secrets with the CIC provider is if there's a similar cases like secrecy I, uh, the impact is kind of high. Right? Imagine you have to uh, all the important secrets that you have you store in the CIC providers, and then if um, something like the hacker managed to steal the encryption key and they can decrypt all your encrypted secrets, then the impact is high to your organization. And then there are some specific secrets that are uh, risky. Like, for example, if they are scopeless or they have too much permissions. And it's also kind of hard to rotate these secrets regularly inside the CIC providers. You need to rotate your secrets when uh, someone who has interacted with secrets leaves the organization or you have found out like some cases whereby there's a external or internal threats trying to steal the secrets. But it's kind of hard to rotate it regularly because there's too many and you're not very sure who store the secrets in your CIC providers. Right? So one way is not to store the secrets with a CIC provider is to actually inject the secrets during the runtime. Um, there are examples like this, like you could use an external uh, secrets valve, and then during your CI CICD workflow runtime, you inject the secrets in the environment variable. So this means you don't store any uh, secrets at rest with the CIC providers. You only use it when you need to, and you get the secrets from your secret bug. Uh, the downside of this is if you are new, uh, and a new organization, you can actually set up this and get your team to be familiar with it. But the downside, if you are existing organization, you probably have a some process really how people use the secrets. So to change the whole organization to use secret injection, it gonna be take some operations overhead for you to do this. So my suggested uh, approach is first, uh, you focus on uh, creating an inventory of all your secrets stored in your CICD provider first. And then based on that, you identify uh, what kind of risky secrets you are being stored in the CICD providers. So what kind of uh, characteristics are there with uh, risky secrets? Uh, first, they are scopeless, or if you find some secrets is not granular enough in the scope, you might treat them as a high-risk secret. Or any secrets that can retrieve from sensitive data from any platform. Maybe you are trying to generate a report and this token can retrieve from some sensitive secrets or sensitive data. And then uh, any secrets that can actually have a right access to somewhere to change something in your repo or deploy some changes, this is considered to be risky. And then uh, based on this um, identification of the risky secrets, you run the custom workload outside of your CI-CD provider. So let me go through uh, some of this issues here. Our first part is relating to the scopeless token. So I think it's an updated security design to not to have any scope with the token itself, but it still exists in some legacy tools. So some of them have a very simplistic scope as well. So whatever uh, the user generate the token, that token will have the permission of that user. So imagine this, your user is an admin. So that means that this token will be kind of I mean token, right? You can't change like this token to have only read access, no write access. So scopeless token is one of the problem. Another problem is uh sometimes there's scope with the token, but it's not granular enough. 
So, uh, for example, just a GitHub token, you can probably restrict this token to have uh, read access or write access to a particular repo. So they have something called a fine green token, but you can't really restrict it to say, oh, you, this token only can be used to write to a single file. And then uh, there's also no way to restrict it to say to write to a specific branch only. And then doing IP restriction with that particular token is hard. So how do we handle um, this kind of scopeless or lack of granular scope issues? Um, my suggestion is to, you need to build your own uh, on-demand service that uh, allow your CICD workflow to call the service. Inside this service, you, use, I mean, you need to write some custom code ready to limit what kind of actions can be done with this using of these secrets. And then if you have some custom with your service, you can actually add IP restriction where this workflow can be used. So just let's look at the example here. So we have a CIC provider and a team is trying to run a workflow. So they are, inside this workflow, uh, they made a call. Instead of running an entire action inside the CIC provider, then that's, you need to store the secrets here. Now you store the secrets inside a uh, vault itself, separated from your CIC provider. And then the workflow will just make a call to this uh, temporary workload. So one of the way you can do this is using, if you are using AWS or any cloud provider, you can use their serverless workload. And then you can use code to perform an action. And you can customize, you only can write to this specific branch, right to this specific file, and nothing else. So this is like adding like a wrapper to the secret itself, and you are making your own restriction on how the secret would be used. Uh, yes, funny, uh, before the end of this session, I just want to say that not there are some secrets that are actually being they are useful that you can store inside your CIC providers. Uh, these secrets are, are known as the canary or honey pot tokens, right? Um, so what it does is when, when you try to store this token in some strategically in some repos or some organization secrets, if someone try to use it, uh, you can detect some possible intrusion. Someone there's an external thread or internal thread. So another thing is about the infrastructure secrets. So whether you are using it for provisioning or deploying your app, um, these are actually considered high risk secrets. And you should consider not using the same platform, using the C separating the CI from the CD itself. So uh, what other solutions can you use? Instead of using the CI providers to deploy stuff, you could use an external, another kind of solutions. For resource provisioning, you can, yeah, many solutions like Terraform Cloud, Polymy, Space Leaf, et cetera. And if you want to deploy your app itself and you are using Kubernetes, uh, there are other options that you can use. Argo CD, Flux CD. Uh, why do, uh, this uh, more towards the long lived secrets, right? When you're using resource provisioning. So why not we use some um, short lived secrets? So this secrets will be um, distracted after a specific period of time. So let's take a look. So next principle that we'll focus on is towards um, reducing uh, long lived secrets in CI-CD workflow. So rotating secrets is not easy if you are working in a DevOps or operations um, team. You know this is a challenging task. You need to keep track of the inventories of all your CI-CD secrets. And then when do you need to rotate them? 
if you have a security incident or someone left the organization or the token got expired and then something breaks and you need to add the secret signal. Or even periodically, when people are leaving, uh, maybe 90 days, you need to rotate the secrets. So how do you, since it's so difficult, how do you actually reduce this secrets rotations, right? First, um, if you store this high risk secrets outside of your CIC provider, uh, you can have a clearer um, process of where the secrets is coming from, and then you can limit who can access the secrets. So if someone have not ever used the secret before, uh, you can uh, conclude that, okay, these secrets uh, do not need to be rotated at the moment. And then another thing is um, something uh, that is uh, common now is to use uh, short-lived secrets if possible. And if you can't, uh, if your vendor doesn't provide short-lived secrets and you need to use long-lived secrets, you need to find a way to automate this and rotate this long-lived secrets. So I mentioned about the short-lived secrets. Uh, most of the VCS, they already support this long-lived secrets when you are trying to generate credentials from your cloud service provider. And then they use something called the OIDC uh, workflow. So at a high level, how it works is this, right? Uh, you have a OIDC provider. This is managed by your CICD provider. So what happened is your CICD provider, they will sign the claims of this CI workflow that you have. They will generate a identity token. They will send this identity token to your cloud service provider. In this case, it will be, uh, and the, this example will be AWS. And then AWS will validate this token, whether this is valid. It's actually a JWT, so you can check whether this is valid or not. And then if this is valid and verified, you return the temporary credentials to the workflow. With this temporary credentials, you can set it in your CI uh, environment and then use it to perform the task. So what they miss is you actually have to trust your CIC provider to actually sign, they manage your key properly to sign this JWT. And then you need to configure the trust relationship uh, on what kind of identity token the information is that, that you trust. Short-lived secrets are, in my experience, is very useful because uh, Anytime you have a security incident, right? The first thing, the operations overhead you have is actually to rotate your secrets, right? Especially it's related to your CI/CD. Uh, so with short-lived secrets, you can actually reduce this rotations overhead because uh, all your secrets will just be ephemeral. It'll just be temporary. And then now you can focus actually on how any there's any suspicious usage of this temporary secrets. So some of the ways that uh, most of the VCS implemented on the OIDC authentication, most of them you can restrict uh, by the repo itself or by the branch itself. So what it means is uh, for you can restrict only specific repo to generate a secret for a particular permissions or to run the CI within a based on a particular branch to generate uh, secrets. Uh, sometimes they, they have this less restrictive rules that allow wildcards in your permissions as well. Another thing is if you are using self-hosted CI CD runners itself, uh, you can actually restrict where the temporary credentials can be used if you have a static IP. So let's take a look at this. Um, this is a uh, IAM role, the trust policy of IAM role containing uh, some of the YDC configurations with GitHub itself. So in this case, uh, 
you will only allow this uh, role to be assumed by uh, inside a repo itself in an organization. And then here we added, you can actually add something like uh, to restrict that this role can only be used in a particular runners, right? Especially if you have something um, that's a high risk kind of workflow, you should have some sort of restriction on the IP as well, not just uh, setting this uh, this branch uh, restriction or this repo restriction. Uh, some problems with short-lived secrets adoption. What I notice is, uh, although uh, is the all the cloud service providers provide this kind of um, support, not every other. Uh, this is not widely supported yet by any other SaaS tools as well. So, for this kind of scenario, you need to have a custom job to treat this long-lived secret as temporary. So you need to rotate them using some automation. And then OIDC role is not without flaws. So sometimes there can be misconfigurations. So not many, um, so I mentioned, um, so all the cloud service provider allowed this temporary short-lived token, but many of the CI tools uh, right now, the when you're using for build, scanning your code, testing your code, itself, they are still using long-lived secrets right so it's a problem here so you need to rotate these long live credentials regularly so one way is uh, periodically you need to refresh these long live secrets and then um, this has some overhead for the, if you are managing this CICD operations Another issue with um, OIDC token is sometimes it can be misconfigured. Uh, every time you say a wildcard in your role itself, you need to be careful. Like, especially like, for example, if you put a wildcard in the branches, what it means is uh, anyone in the repo itself, if they can create a new branch, they can actually use the credentials. Uh, the worst is you put a wildcard in the repo name itself, that means Anyone in the organization can actually use the role itself. Okay, uh, let me move on to the last part. It will be it's related to uh, how we can reduce the secret leakage in the CI CD workflows. Uh, these are the, some of the sources that we have um, known about where secrets can be lit. So it could be inside your Git repositories. It could be from your application logs, your CI/CD logs, and from your build artifacts as well. Uh, I won't be covering this. Yeah, but there's many resources on this, like how secrets have been leaked in your Docker image and how you can scan for it. Uh, the first thing is to prevent secret leakage in your Git repositories. I think this is uh, we are heading in a positive directions with regards to this issue. Uh, currently, there are many specialized SaaS tools for scanning secrets. So uh, they are not just like scanning for keywords and then say you found a password because that's a variable name password. So it's more sophisticated to scan, to detect whether this is a secret or not. So because of this uh, smarter checks here, there are less false positives if you use this specialized SaaS tool to scan for secrets. Another thing is the known secrets pattern. So if we know that this, uh, how the secrets might look like with a particular uh, particular patterns, like it starts with a particular pattern with a particular prefix and the suffix is uh, maybe 64 characters long, etc. If we know this uh, pattern, it's easy for us to detect 
secrets and build tools on top of it. So many of the SaaS, specialized SaaS tools that scan secrets, they already utilize this. Another thing is the Git hooks itself. Uh, so uh, let me go through this. So inside your uh, Git workflows itself, there's many ways that you can prevent secrets from being leaked to your repositories. The first part here uh, is at the pre-commit hook itself. So this is before you, you try to make a commit and then before you make the commit successfully, successfully you can run a secret checks here. So I call I would say this is like a gut rails for your developers, DevOps engineer. It's a gut rails because uh you can't really control this by here. So this is used by the engineers itself to make sure that their due diligence is not to leak the secrets in their comics. And then they can fix the issue early before they try to make the comment. So if uh, somehow this process is bypassed in the pre-commit itself and they try to push a secret, then there's a pre-receive hook that you can run to block the secrets. So if you are using on-premise um, on premise VCS, you can actually run your own pre-receive hook. So what it means is you scan the secrets here in your push. And then if you find any secrets, at this stage, you can actually block the push. This way, uh, you can't push any secrets to your repositories. Yeah, because of this two process, one is to prevent the secrets early, and the other is to uh, block the secrets from being pushed. Uh, this can help to reduce the number of secrets being leaked in your Git repositories. Uh, one thing you need to take note is uh, you need to be careful of any blind spots that you have. So if you run your secret scanning, get hooks, etc., and then uh, you focus entirely just on your organization, you might miss out secrets that are being leaked outside of your organization, maybe in some public repos. So this is a challenging issue. Uh, there are so many repos and you need to monitor all your developers and your uh, DevOps team, whether they create any public repos or not. And then whether the repos contain secrets, this is kind of challenging. Uh, I think there are some commercial tools that you can actually explore. They are, they are specialized. They have the data. The data that you need to do this task of monitoring is kind of huge but they have this data that you can use to monitor who are lit, potentially leak secrets in the public repo. So beware of blind spot. Do not just think about the issue being involved in your organization. You need to see a whole picture in the public repos as well. The next part is about uh, reducing leakage in your application logs. Uh, this might seem like it's related to application security, but uh, I think it's at a CICD process, you should uh, detect this kind of issue as well. So what kind of secrets might be leaked in the application logs? Uh, most likely it's related to a secrets relating to your users, it might be session tokens, API tokens, uh, that your developers accidentally log it. And then, so sometimes it might be an indirect leaks itself. The, it's not intentional, but when you try to log a request body, uh, request header, or some JSON data, it might contain sensitive information or secrets itself. So one of the way is um, you can stop the bleeding is if this issue has happened many times in your organization and you want to stop it, uh, first part here is to stop 
bleeding. So if you see a lot of issues happening, you need to stop certain percentage of it from happening. One way is to write custom SAS rules. You want to detect whether there are any raw requests or response being logged in your application. And then you can set up a process in the code review itself. If you detect raw requests, response being logged itself, it should be reviewed during the code uh, review process in the PRs. And then the code reviewer should see whether when you're logging this information, you are accidentally logging any secrets. So these are some examples in different language or different framework that you might want to uh, write the custom rules on. So when you see keywords like request or body or headers, you might want to flag it up and then just, uh, if your SAS tool can support this, you just want to flag it up during the code review process, but not as a actual issues because there will be too many noise in this. Okay, the third part here would be relating to how we can reduce secret leakage in CI/CD logs. What you notice is uh, most of the logs will be automatically masked by your CI/CD providers. Uh, this is okay to prevent issues like if you try to echo out that secrets in your logs. This will be masked and you can't see the secrets. But uh, there may be cases where someone's tried to retrieve the secrets, whether it's for a valid purpose or the, it's a malicious action. So what you can do is you can actually echo the secrets and then base it before encode that secrets output. So what you will see is the base before encode the value of this token, and then you can decode it to get the secrets, right? So. This actually bypass the masking kind of uh, checks that CICD providers provide. So how do you prevent this issue? Uh, one way you can do it is to write a custom rule. So this is just an example from SendGrab. Um, you can write a custom rules on this. Like every time you see the keyword, token and try, someone tries to use a base uh, 64 or base 32 encoding, you should flag it out as an issue. Or someone try to um, get uh, AWS credentials and then base 64 encode it. So custom rules at least can be written and then to to detect kind of this kind of potential leakage in the CI process. So how do you do it uh, in a safe way if you really need to retrieve the secrets? Uh, there are cases where you need to retrieve the secrets for maybe someone do not know uh, what's the secrets value and they want to use it in another repo or someone left the organization and they want to debug that secrets. So if you have valid reason to retrieve the secrets, uh, first thing you can do is uh, base 64 encoding, but after that you encrypt that secrets and then avoid printing this um, encrypted value uh, out in the logs itself. Send it to a out of band service it can be a Lambda function. If you have bird, you can use a bird collaborator. Yep. And then avoid printing this value out because uh, you don't have to print it out. Every time you print out the value, if you someone managed to get the key from you and they can decrypt the value. Okay. Uh, the takeaway from this talk is we have covered um, quite a lot of information, um, but at a high level here, I want to go back to this uh, slide here on this factors affecting how uh, we can control the security levels of the secrets. 
there are five different factors here that you can implement in your controls of the secrets. Sometimes you can control them. Sometimes you need to build custom uh, wrapper on how the secrets will be used. And based on these factors here, we uh, have identified like three principles that we have to actually enhance the CICD security secrets. So we have gone through many, many, many tasks. Like what are things you can do? These are all different options you can try out based on your context itself. Okay, this is the end of my talk. Thanks everyone. Great job, Bobby. This uh, secrets management sounds like it'd be a really good OWASP project to have, by the way. Um, there's a couple of questions and uh, uh, let me ask you some. Uh, you talked about uh, secret management in Git hooks. Uh, do you find in your research that there are more uh, uh, issues with uh, secret management in the client side hooks or the server side hooks? Uh, I think for client side hooks itself, uh, mm -hmm. most of the secrets we have uh, detected uh, based on the known patterns. And then because of this uh, known patterns, we can actually write. Uh, Kind of like hooks that can actually detect this mm. issues well to actually actually prevent the secrets from even being pushed to your mm. GitHub repos. So I I think that because of this becoming hook itself, it actually prevents detections from the later stage, which is the the pre received hook. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, good point. Yeah. There we go. So there are less issues being found here because uh, you are already trying to prevent secrets from being leaked. Right, okay. So next question. So um, with a short-lived secret, can you help us understand how you would define a short-lived uh, secret? And really, is there some type of recommended lifetime? Uh, in most cases, it would be depending on the CI/CD workflow, but I don't think it will take, if your workflow takes more than one hour, then you probably don't want to run it in your CI/CD workflow. I think it's not actually a suitable way to run it. Okay. And then, so usually it's less than one hour, but if you have some cases, unique cases, you need to run more, more than one hour, you can actually adjust that, that short life sequence. But if, if a secret can last more than like a few days or a few weeks, a few months, it's probably not considered short-lived secrets mm -hmm. because you need to, uh, every time you try to, you need to rotate a secret, it's probably that it's not a short-lived secret. Yeah, I would say that's true. Uh, often I think uh, enterprises will use their uh, uh, secrets from their, uh, uh, web application security tools, SaaS tools, or whatever, and just leave that token in there. And uh, that could be uh, problematic if uh, with minor changes around that. Tell me about uh, um, with uh, CICD secrets and the crit really the critical nature of CICD secrets. Um, how do you see the industry as a whole evolving uh, to further in ensure their security? Uh, yeah, so first thing is, uh, I think we are heading towards the usage of short-lived secrets. Although it's not prevalent yet, I, I see the future is actually not to use any static tokens that can last for a few months and rotate it. It's uh, not beneficial for the security team and not beneficial for the development team as well. They have too much overhead to rotate the secrets. So we should move towards like uh, short-lived secrets counting. Kind of Everyone uh, provide OIDC services and then uh, the, set up the trust relationship if you're a customer and then with, with your VCS and then 
because with this relationship, you generate short lived secrets and then yeah, use the secrets. You don't need to rotate any secrets. If we do this, I see a lot of secrets will be reduced. We don't usually need to store a lot of secrets. Okay. So there's a lot of tools that people I'm sure uh, have used or familiar with, like uh, the AWS Secrets Manager and the Azure Key Vault. Um, and then there's the stuff like uh, Travel Hog or HashiCorp or, or, or things like that. But uh, um, in your experience, are there specific tools uh, that you would recommend uh, for identifying unnecessary uh, secrets uh, stored at rest within these CI CD providers? Uh, I think it requires you to create an inventory first to find out what kind of secrets you already have. Sometimes you might get surprises why uh, particular team store the secrets in this repo and you need to have an inventory first and then you find out is this secrets risky first? And then I don't see there's a really a tool to tell you whether the secrets is risky or not yet. Yeah. You have yeah, it's kind of like a still a human process you need to detect the issue first. I wondered if you saw that. So um so since there really isn't an easy button tool for detecting these types of uh, secret leakage, then uh, um what what are the ways that you would recommend for our audience um to we're doing good on time. What are the re recommended ways that you would? What are the ways that you would recommend to our audience uh, to get started uh, with uh, applying the principles that you just talked about? Yeah. Uh, okay. There are many ways, but um, first thing is I think you need to find out uh, what kind of secrets you have. Maybe you don't really have a lot of secrets being stored, you know, CIC providers, then uh, your risk level is kind of medium or low. But if you have a lot of secrets, then you need to find out what are the dangerous ones. Like I mentioned is uh, scopeless tokens and then who is using it. And then after you detect uh, the risky tokens, then you need to consider uh, building uh, if you can't build your custom code yourself to 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 control how the secrets will be used, then uh, you need to find a way to see where you can run in a restricted way inside the CIC workflow, and then how you set up controls to make sure everyone wants to use it. Then it needs to go through an approval to approve that workflow before you can use the secret. And then okay. if you can uh, try to, if you have any, you are still using any long day secrets with a cloud provider, you should really change it to OID zeros. That, that, that will give you a win for your security team and the operations team and your development team. Yeah, it sure does. Uh, we've come to our end. So thank you, uh, Bobby Lynn. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Uh, secrets management is something that I don't think enough uh, uh, SMBs or, or multinationals uh, uh, concentrate enough on. Um, it's not the typical application security uh, check boxes that uh, uh, people are, are uh, trying to uh, uh, go for and, and protect. So this was a fantastic uh, presentation. So outstanding, Bobby Lynn. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, everybody, for uh, attending this uh, uh, session. Let's we'll see you in more. Thanks, everyone. Bye.